Bhandang saranang gacchami, Dhammang saranang gacchami, Sangang saranang gacchami, Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gacchami, Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gacchami, Duty ampi sangang saranang gachami. Tati ampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tati ampi sangang saranang gachami. So friends, uh, welcome to this uh, Sunday program. And uh, we're going over some Dhammapada verses. And uh, this week, we'll, we're going to look at some verses in chapter three of the Dhammapada, which is uh, called uh, the chapter on, on the mind or the chitta vaga about the mind. So I'm going to uh, uh, recite the Pali verses for the stanzas uh, connected with the, uh, you know, on the, on the verses and then re uh, read the meaning in, in English. Pandanam chapalam chittam durakkam dunivarayam ujjum karoti medavi usukaro vate janam varejova tate kitto okamokat ubato paripandati medam chittam maradeyam pahat. I'm going to uh, translate these uh, verses. The flickering, fickle mind, difficult to con difficult to guard, difficult to control. The wise person straightens it out as a Fletcher straightens an arrow. In the second verse, like a fish that is drawn from its watery abode and thrown upon the land that flips around. And so is this mind always fluttering about. Hence, the mind should be tamed, the realm of passion should be uh, shunned. So the flickering fickle mind. So that means basically our own mind, the mind of the average person that uh, is constantly like flickering in the wind. So you see on the photo behind me, the candle uh, flame of course, now it looks like a still photo, but you know, normally the, the candle flame flickers about. So our mind is always flickering. That means it, it's reacting to different stimuli. You know, it's getting uh, irritated or disturbed by unpleasant sensations, or it's wanting to uh, you know, react to different sights, sounds, smells, and tastes with different types of reactions out of desire and aversion, and it causes our body to, to flicker around also. You know, that we're going to want to itch this and rub this and look at that and look at that and squirm around because of pain. So, uh, you know, that's due to the flickering mind. Uh, and so, you know, it's difficult to, to guard and control. That's because these urges and impulses come deep within the uh, uh, nervous system and uh, are 
come from the unconscious part of our mind. Basically, they're the habits that we've accumulated, uh, you know, since our whole life or even uh, coming from uh, past lives, the kind of conditionings and the way we've trained ourselves uh, to act and react and not being contented very long. And the mind is always grasping uh, at uh, the various sensory stimulations coming uh, through the senses. And so basically it doesn't give us much peace of mind and it gets us caught up in all kinds of unwholesome uh, actions. So the wise person straightens it out as a Fletcher straightens an arrow. So if you know an arrow shaft, which most people may not be familiar with arrows, but uh, you know, you could imagine it, or you've seen, let's say the old, uh, you know, Western uh, movies, you know, with <laughs> Indians shooting arrows. Now, if they had a, didn't have a straight arrow that, you know, they're, they're not gonna hit the target. So in the same way, uh, if the arrow is bent, then uh, you cannot hit the target. So if our mind is bent, that means if it's not straight, straight with the Dhamma, that means keeping our mind straight, means keeping it uh, grounded in the present moment with mindfulness and understanding and not allowing it to uh, you know, go off on the different uh, uh, extremes to keep it balanced and in the, in the middle with mindfulness and understanding. And then like the, <clears throat> so that's one kind of, uh, you know, analogy about uh, the mind. And then like the fish that is drawn from water. So I was, you know, jokingly conversing with Reed. Uh, you can see up there, uh, there's a fish aquarium, a tank there. Now, if he was to draw one of these uh, fish out and put it on his desk, it would flop you know, around this way and that is struggling to get back into the water. So uh, that's an analogy for our mind that it, it gets, it flops around, uh, you know, uh, in the same way as I already mentioned with, uh, you know, chasing sensual pleasures or avoiding irritations and pain. It's, it's constantly on the, the move and struggling to get what it wants or struggling to get away from it, uh, from what it wants. Uh, and uh, that's due to uh, the realm of passions. So the, the last part of the verse says, uh, hence the realm of passion should be uh, shunned or let's say, you know, they should be tamed and uh, gradually overcome. So you can say, you can see that, you know, the whole practice of Dhamma is, is sort of focused on that because, you know, the whole Buddhist teachings is about the nature of suffering, the cause of suffering. Now, that there can be an end to suffering and then the path leading to the end of suffering. And basically the, the essential root of suffering is the discontented mind, the mind not being uh, content in the present moment and being caught in the past and future, going between the past and the future going back to recall the past, either with desire or unpleasant memories, pleasant memories, painful memories, and then projecting that into the future with anxiety, fear, worry, worry about not getting what you want, worrying about getting uh, the painful, what you don't want. That's really the underlying, that's the drive behind most people's lives is, uh, you know, they, most people live their life basically striving to, to get what they want and to avoid 
and get away from things that they don't want. And a lot of that is based on, you know, the memories of the, uh, the past and then projecting that into the future. Because you had a painful experience in the past. So you think if the similar thing happens again, you're projecting that in the future, thinking that the same thing is going to happen again in the future. So it struggles. Let's say, let's say just a typical example. Okay. Like, with, with a let's say a, a somebody you knew from many years ago, maybe a friend or maybe it was a relative, and maybe you had some unpleasant experience with them, and then you you decided that you didn't really like that person. But then maybe it was several years have gone by, and you know that person may have have changed. You know that that person could have got into meditation or whatever. Maybe he was, uh, they were uh, an alcoholic or on drugs in those days. Maybe they stopped, uh, went into rehab and stopped taking drugs. And, you know, they're a changed person, but you're still clinging on to that memory about how the person was. And so if they call you up out of the blue and say, oh, I'm going to come and visit you after several years, you might start worrying, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, I don't really want this person to come. And so you you know, you took your plan and scheme, how are you going to, you know, uh, give an excuse why, why the, the person uh, shouldn't come, you know, well, maybe I'll say I'm going on a holiday, or maybe I'll say I got other relatives coming, and you might spend a lot of time, you know, your mind flipping around on that issue. And then at the end, the person says, well, I'm, I'm you know, I came down with COVID-19, and I can't come now. So, you know, so you might have spent a long time worrying and fretting about projecting something in the future that didn't come to pass. So that's just one, one, one example, a very common example, I'm sure. So, but that's because the mind is always uh, remembering things from the past and, and projecting that into the, uh, the future uh, and uh, to cause unnecessary uh, worry and fear and anxiety because uh, so much of the fears and worries that we have uh, you know if you have patience and so on a lot of them wind up you know not panning out so anyway learning how to to understand and you know the, the meditation practice is about learning how to to see impermanence and to understand the impermanence of all of our past experiences and the conditionings that we have and how we've got entangled into this tug of war and push and pull between things that we want, things that we uh, don't want and all of the mental projections and the neurotic kind of thoughts and reactions uh, that we have uh, based on, you know, whatever is going on uh, uh, around us. And a lot of it is really, you know, not necessary. And it's what we call self-created uh, suffering. We think the world is causing us suffering, but it's actually our mind's reaction to the world that, that is causing our suffering. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, we can, uh, you know, again, if any of you have any uh, questions on any of these things that we're talking about, you can write them down as uh, chats uh, so that uh, you know we could further uh, try to clarify it uh, you know at the end. Anyway, the story behind those uh, uh, those two verses is a very uh, is a, a very brief story. It says simply there was a a monk who had been overcome by his uh, negative thoughts about others and so on. And the, the Buddha admonished him to subdue his mind. That means admonished him to, you know, by following the, the precepts in the practice of meditation uh, to calm uh, the mind so it doesn't bring so much uh, suffering to himself and to, to others around him.
So uh, this, these couple more verses that are very similar in their, in their nature, in their meaning. Duni gahasa lahuno yata kamani patino chittasa damato sadhu chittam dantam sukhavaham. Sudasam Sudasam suni punyam yata kamani patinam chittam raket medavi chittam guttam sukhavaham. <clears throat> so, the translation of these verses the mind is hard to check, swift, flits wherever it listeth. To control it is good. A controlled mind is conducive to happiness. <clears throat> and the second verse, the translation. The mind is very hard to perceive, extremely subtle, flits wherever it listeth. Let the wise person guard it. A guarded mind is conducive to happiness. So these two verses are kind of connected. The mind is hard to check. That means when the thought comes up, because we don't see it soon enough, it triggers off so many nervous system connections and uh, perceptions and memories that uh, it's it's hard to, you know it it uh, <clears throat> you know grabs a hold of our nervous system and mind uh, before we really know what is happening and and that's because it's hard to perceive so it's hard to check because it's hard to perceive that means our awareness is not uh, sharp enough to clearly see these urges to want to, uh, you know, react or uh, think before we can, uh, you know, have our mindfulness on them. And, and, and the mind quickly changes its objects of its attention and thought and basically uh, under its own uh, power, it, mainly because we don't have the uh, sharp mindfulness. And uh, I usually give this little example uh, how uh, actually uh, about mindfulness and an, and an octopus, okay? So, you know, a mindful, uh, an octopus has eight, uh, you know, well, yeah, eight. <laughs> eight, eight, eight tentacles, right? So if an octopus gets one tentacle on you, it's fairly easy to, you know, pull that tentacle off and toss it. But each time an octopus gets another tentacle on you, it gets harder and harder to uh, get it off. So in the, in the same way, or and then if an octopus gets seven or eight tentacles on you, and you can't get it off, then it drags you out to sea and drowns you and eats you. So that's very often that what happens to to us or to you know to people who uh, cannot uh, check or control uh, their thoughts uh, quick enough. Uh, and so it's because our attention is not grounded in the body, and our thoughts and unconscious mind is is occurring you know deep within the nervous system. But normally our mind is just on the surface, 
just on the surface of what we see and hear around us. It's not centered uh, deep inside to see the uh, uh, subtler vibrations. So we only, uh, you know, see the thoughts as they come up and then the thoughts take over our whole mind and before we know it, we're lost in some worry or some anger. It's like we didn't really see the thought coming. You know, sort of like a, a person watching television. Let's say you're watching television in your house, you're watching some program and you're engrossed in the program and you know, you're not really uh, uh, detached or you're not kind of in touch with the body. Your mind is getting emotional and, you know, rooting for the good guys or the bad guys or a hot steamy uh, scene or something like that. So you're not really centered and relaxed. And so you don't hear the sound of a car driving up in, in the front yard or you don't hear the neighbors the dog barking or your own dog barking because you're engrossed in the uh, TV and you're not kind of, uh, you know, uh, very uh, alert to your surroundings. And then, you know, you don't hear the person climbing over the back fence. And then you don't hear the person, you know, with a screwdriver trying to, you know, open your window, or raise the window up. And uh, <clears throat> then they sneak in the back window and you know go through the your kitchen and steal all your valuable uh, silverware or you know goes into your bedroom and steals the jewelry or whatever and it gets away uh, because you didn't you didn't hear them coming you know you weren't attentive uh, or you were half asleep but in this case you're distracted with the with the tv so instead, if you're mindful and a car drove up outside, you'd be where you, you'd say, oh, there's a car coming up. Okay, it's a, you know. But at least you know that somebody come up. And then maybe the neighbor's dog bark or your dog start barking. Then you'd say, well, my, bark, my dog wouldn't bark at the uh, people I know, you know? So you, you get a little bit like alert, right? And then, then you heard some noise on your back fence. You said, well, a, a friend wouldn't climb over my back fence. You know? So you get more alerted and you get up and you, you walk to you know, the, the back and stand by the, you know, the, the, the kitchen window. And the guy's opening the window you climb through the window and you're standing there with a bag and then you put the bag over his head and call the cops you know, before he was able to steal your things. So that's similar to the practice of mindfulness in order to control our thoughts and our fickle mind by being grounded in the, in the present moment, by being more centered in the body, we can see these urges and impulses before they've you know, taken over your whole mind. And we can say, ah, okay, there's anger is arising now. Okay, well, you know, don't react. You just, you know, what's the cause of this anger? Okay, somebody said something to me. Okay, is it really that big of a deal, you know? And, and so on, you, you, you have a few moments to kind of reflect on it. And saying, you know, is he getting angry about it? Is that really gonna do me any good right now? You know, can I really do anything about it right now? It's just poison for my own mind uh, to get lost in this uh, anger or resentment. So anyway, you have time to reflect and hopefully you'd say, yeah, you know, let it go. You know, there's no need to react to that right now. Or it could be any other type of annoying thoughts, but at least, you know, you're able to check it. That means checking the mind means not allowing it to grow and, uh, you know, trigger off so many other types of uh, reactions and, and, and thoughts. And that's the way you subdue uh, the mind also. But it's because of the mindfulness. Uh, 
and especially the mindfulness that's centered and grounded in the body because that's where everything is everything passes through the body the whole world uh, arises within this body mind process that means you know almost all of our experiences come through the eyes ears nose tongue and the skin probably 90 90% of our reactions and attention in daily life is in bringing up the past and the future is related to things that are coming through our five physical uh, senses and the mind reacts to them so uh and in guarding the mind is is the uh domain of the you know uh, mindfulness uh, really mindfulness is like a, the watchdog right so this dog's supposed to be watching your house right so if a stranger drives up in a strange car or somebody's walking around your yard that the dog doesn't know you're going to bark so the same way when any uh, thoughts or even painful body feelings or any sounds or anything is starting to get you irritated uh the mind is like the dog it kind of bark or woof woof Okay, pains are rising now. And it kind of alerts you. Okay, relax around it. Don't get excited. It's not that bad. And you can kind of watch that, that sensation or that sound, see what it's doing in, within you. And you can, uh, you know, kind of put some space around it by reflecting on it, as I already mentioned. And uh, then oftentimes by doing that, you, the, by not reacting immediately it may disappear within one or two seconds or maybe longer but you just watch that itch for example or that irritation some irritating sound and just relaxing around it being aware of the urges to want to react but you're telling us okay relax relax you don't need to get excited and then that sensation or sound stops because it's impermanent and then you save yourself the the reaction that you would have wasted your energy in reacting such as like itching a scratch right that's a very good example because it happened hundreds of times to people during the day you have an itch and so just unconsciously without even thinking about it most people will just you know do this or do this or, you know uh, with so many irritations that especially body sensation because they're so common uh and it may seem harmless enough but each time you make that kind of reactions and trying to get away from discomfort you you know you put a little bit of stress in the nervous system so uh that's why the mindfulness is the watchdog to alert you basically alert you so that you can relax and not immediately react you give yourself a, a few seconds of time to reflect is it really necessary to react to this right now is it really going to bring any benefit and so uh you know we we use the the right efforts you know we can uh, exercise the the right effort of the eight four path the effort to uh, you know abandon the negative thoughts and uh, the effort to cultivate the the wholesome types of thoughts so <clears throat> uh, that's what basically these uh you know these four verses that I went over they're dealing with that uh the practice of learning how to control and straighten out our thoughts by exercising mindfulness right understanding and also right effort now those are the three pillars of the eightfold path the right understanding the right mindfulness and the right effort every time something happens to us we hear a sound we uh, see something feel something even think about something uh that right understanding you know understands that these things are impermanent 
and the mindfulness is able to kind of just watch it without immediately reacting. And then the right effort to uh, apply the appropriate antidotes, especially for the negative type of uh, uh, impulses and to replace them with the wholesome type of impulses so that we can avoid accumulating more and more type of uh, stress, anxiety, worry, and fear, uh, you know, in the mind. So having said that much, uh, I'd like to now uh, open it up and see if uh, there's any uh, questions uh, based on any of that. And you can write them on the, the chat or if there's no, it looks like there's one uh, chat here and see where it is, it might be. A, okay, well, I already, that's not really a question. So, uh, now, <clears throat> if somebody wants to just ask a question, you can unmute yourself, and I, I guess is a, is a Prashant, are you still out there in the virtual land somewhere? Yes, I'm there. I'm there. Okay. <laughs> if anybody wants to directly ask a question uh, through the microphone, then uh, you could say, okay, here's one question. So the, would you say that there's always a bodily component to mental activity? Is being aware of bodily sensation a reliable way to stay alert to arising defilements? Uh, well, not always. Now, certainly for uh, body irritations, there's a bodily component. In other words, if there's no itch or pain in the body arising, then you're not gonna have thoughts about the non-existent itch or pain. Although if I told you now, okay, we're gonna meditate for two hours at a stretch, then you, your mind might remember how you got pain in your body after just 30 minutes of sitting and think, oh my gosh, I gotta sit for an hour and projecting that you're gonna have a lot of pain if you sit for an hour. So in that sense, yes, there's a bodily component of the memory of the past uh, and projecting that into the future. So uh, that's a bodily component uh, from, from the past. And in the last uh, <clears throat> Sutta class last Wednesday, actually, that was, that was part of these uh, 36 types of feelings. Uh, the 108 types of feelings based on the feelings from uh, the past and the present also that we're imagining a certain feeling is going to arise in, well, a certain feeling has a right, we remember it having come from the past and then projecting that it will arise uh, again in the future. Uh, so, and so a lot of those are connected with uh, uh, the bodily uh, component. But a lot of times there's just random memories, right? Like in dreams also is, is, you know, you're not really aware of the body in the dream and the, you know, uh, you know, you have dream images or even in daily life, daydreams, you know, your mind just wanders to something. But it's usually connected with some physical thing in the past. So there is a bodily component, but it's coming from the past. It's not necessarily a present a moment bodily sensation, but it's the memory of uh, a sensation from the, the past that the mind is uh, recreating uh, in the present. Uh, and in the same way, uh, our habits are formed. Let's say if you have an itch. So if I had an itch, you know, in, from the past and, you know, for many years, every time you have an itch, you just naturally you're going like this all the time, you know, or a stinging sensation or some pain, right? You're always, you know, 
doing this. So those are kind of built in the muscle memory. And when a similar type of pain comes up, you just assume that it's something that you have to, to try to get rid of because these are just hardwired circuits within the, the nervous system. But with mindfulness, you can interrupt that urge to want to itch. So that's why you have to be aware of the urge to want to itch. So when you're deeply aware of the body and you feel that initial, you know, some vibration, uh, you can be aware, ah, okay, this uh, itch is arising. And short circuit that, that memory of it or short circuit the, the, the habitual pattern of, of the, uh, the afferent and efferent uh, responses of the, of the nervous system. Uh, you know, the incoming signals and then the outgoing signals. That's, all, that's how the whole body and mind operates. They're called the uh, afferent or the, the, the stimulations coming into the nervous system and the efferent are our reactions going out to all the senses, whether it's a physical sensation, it's a sound, sight, smell, taste, touch. There's an incoming vibrations. They go into the uh, nervous system, the unconscious mind. They trigger off memories and, and conditioned reactions. And then that energy goes out as a kind of a reaction, like to smile. You know, that's also, you, you hear something pleasant and you smile, or you, you, know, you, or you see your friend or, or something. Or if you saw somebody you didn't like, you might, you know, give a frown. So it, it's all about incoming and outgoing uh, vibrations. That's all our body and mind is. And mindfulness is sitting in the middle. That's what meditation is, keeping your mind in the middle between the incoming vibrations and the outgoing vibrations. So that we can learn to change them. You can only change them in the present moment. And only if you have mindfulness, if you have right understanding, right mindfulness and right effort. That's where you apply it in that crucial transition between the incoming vibrations and the outgoing vibrations. And if the outgoing vibrations are gonna be of a negative sort, you have the time to, re to flip the switch and to change it so the outgoing vibrations take a more positive reaction rather than what would have been an automatic negative reaction. And that's really where the practice of Dhamma is, is rooted. You know, the, the essential practice of Dhamma is, is that. It's is about uh, transforming our mind from reacting negatively, which causes suffering. Uh, to uh, responding in a wholesome way that brings less suffering and eventually leads to more uh, uh, happiness. Okay. So being aware of bodily sensation is one way of being alert, but also, you know, sounds, you might not see, even a sound is producing some kind of a bodily vibration, but unless you have a very, very, really deep level of awareness, you, you, you may not be aware of the, the physical vibrations that are occurring because of a sound or a smell or a taste or a touch, but yes, they are moving through the nervous system. But normally people's minds are not that deeply focused or concentrated. So we, we see it as a mental reaction, the aversion, like you hear a sound, or, you know, there's, well, that's a bodily reaction too, but we only see it when, you know, after the fact. We don't see that the vibrations that are, you know, just a, a nanosecond before the physical reaction. But if you had very deep awareness, you, you might be able to do that. Uh, this other question said, you said that suffering is not being content 
in the present moment? Would it also be not having desire, aversion, ignorance, or detachment in the present moment? Well, if we have uh, aversion, ignorance, and attachment in the present moment, that means we're not content. Uh, so it's because we have desire and aversion that we're not content because we're always wanting some more desire and there's always something we're going to have uh, aversion to. Uh, and uh, contentment really, it's, it's not necessarily contentment, it's, it's having uh, equanimity toward the various sensations that are coming through us. Uh, yeah, the second part of this question, I believe being always content is difficult without applying non-desire, non-aversion. That's true. That's why uh, contentment arises out of, you know, having less and less desires so we're content with just whatever you, you have, you know, you, you're, you're content with just the basic necessities, but people have become so habituated to all these advertisements and thinking that they, they can't be content unless they have the newest gadget, the newest, uh, uh, you know, especially these, uh, all these games that are, you know, these, uh, you know, these virtual games, you games, you know, you play on your cell phones, right? So they're always coming up with new ones because people get bored very easily, not content. You learn how to, you know, perfect one game and, you know, they want something else. And, you know, the whole capitalist system actually works off of people's, uh, you know, discontentment with the present moment. They, they're always wanting more stimulation. But this has been programmed into us over a whole lifetime, especially in this computer era, it's made it even much worse. You know, back when I was a kid, we were content just to, you know, go out and skateboard for three or four hours. We didn't have all these television programs and cell phone games and, and all these other things to distract. You know, people were more content uh, in a certain way. But anyway, so. Is it easier to monitor weird body responses or wired body responses and wired mind responses? Uh, well, you can't really separate the body from the mind. But yes, let's say that's scratching an itch, okay? Let's say, okay, if I have an itch arise, then I see the urge to want to scratch it. Uh, or let's say maybe more vivid example, let's say to, to kill a, an ant or a cockroach that you find in your, your kitchen. Uh, you know, so you take the, the precept of sila, right? So it's easier to control. You, you see that urge to want to squash, but you, 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 don't lift up your arm, you keep your arm down. But the mind still might want to do it, but you're talking yourself out of it. Well, you know, that ant that also wants to live, right? It's not gonna eat that much, you know? It's like, we have mice problems here in our, in our house, but you know, they don't eat that much, they eat a little bit, okay, you know, there's enough to go around. And then we don't get upset, go around trying to, we, if we can catch them, we might put them outside, but we, you know, we don't try to kill them or anything. They're not going to eat that much. And, uh, you know, so we don't, you know, let it hassle our minds too much. Uh, but we could, if we want to run around, try to catch every mouse, and if we can't, that's the price. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if I'm not even saying this, uh, to show that we can control our bodily reaction easier than control our thoughts. So you still might have the desire to, you know, slap the mosquito, for example, but you, you can control the bodily action, but the mind will take longer to uh, get rid of that uh, 
aversion. That's why sila is important. That's why the sila is there. The sila helps us to control the bodily reactions that, uh, you know, we, we make the karma with, like, you know, killing or harming something or, you know, false speech or other things we, we do with the body. And so that's because that's where the strongest karmic reactions come from are the things that we're actually doing with the body. People can't see what's in your mind. So, you know, uh, you know, you could be, you know, mentally cursing them, but, you know, they don't hear any sound coming out of your mouth. So, you know, they might not really know what they're thinking. But if you let out a bunch of four letter words and they hear it, right, then they're going to have a reaction. to you. So, you know, it's easier to control our body to you know, control the thoughts that give rise to those actions. And that's where the concentration and the mindfulness come important part, you know, in the practice of sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila is controlling the bodily reactions. And then concentration, mindfulness and concentration helps you to uh, control the mental reactions, especially the, the concentration or the calmness through meditation. And then the wisdom actually goes down and gets out the root of the thoughts. We, we can control our thoughts for a short period of time, but they're going to come back again because the roots of greed, hatred, and delusion are still there. So, to answer that question, uh, Para is, uh, yeah, it's probably easier to control the bodily responses than the, the mind response. Uh, but, it's, but basically, the mind responses are the ones that, because you're still going to worry about them, even if you don't react physically to the things, the mind is going to continue to think about them and be obsessed about them, and that, that's going to be a kind of suffering. So eventually we have to get to the mind also. Uh, this, uh, this question, are mono chitta vinyana Symptoms, uh, you know, the Pali terms, uh, terms, you know, about uh, the mind, consciousness in the mind. Uh, and it's kind of, a, you know, a little bit complex to describe. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's consciousness, which is basically just awareness, but then there's the content of the awareness. Uh, which is probably more the, the mano, uh, you know, which is comes from the idea of to measure and uh, the various, uh, the, the, the chaita seekers. It's better to use the term uh, chitta and chaita seeker. Chitta means the consciousness. Chaita seekers are the contents of the consciousness, which would be like the greed and aversion and, and the so on that's accompanying the consciousness. The consciousness self is basically just pure. It's the content of the uh, of the, the mental factors that color the consciousness. And so, if there's greed uh, arises, you know, greed arises because you hear, see something that triggers off attachment, and that object is appearing in the consciousness. But because it's the memory that that object triggered on. Uh, so we call it a consciousness with greed, but the consciousness itself is just light, like a movie a motion picture machine at a, at a theater. You know, the old kind, you, you saw the light coming from the back of the theater, right? But uh, the light was going across in the film, which then was up on the screen, and you didn't see the difference between the light and the the picture on the screen. So normally we don't see the difference between our consciousness and the object of the consciousness. It's because we don't have that deep faculty of concentration and awareness to, to, to see it more clearly. And that's where the illusion of that I am doing this arises. Anyway, uh, so, <clears throat> 
these terms are mano and chitta and consciousness. So, you know, these are terms that you can read more about in the Abhidhamma, but it's, it's quite complex and there's no point in, you know, making things too complicated. I prefer just to use the term, you know, the consciousness and the, the chitta and consciousness and then the content of the consciousness. Uh, which are the mental uh, factors. Okay, so it looks like that's all the uh, chat questions. Uh, anybody have any last question they want to ask just by uh, uh, voice? Okay, if not, then um, if not, we can take a, a couple minutes and uh, take a little break to stretch the legs or get a drink of water, use the restroom, and then we'll come back in a few minutes and then we'll do a few stretches and uh, then have our uh, meditation period. Okay, see you back in a few minutes. Can you hear me, uh, Prashant? Yes, Bhante. Okay, so go ahead and try to, to stand straight. Relax your arms and hands at the sides. Gently close the eyes and just Focus your attention where your feet are pressing the floor. Just try to feel that height and the weight of the body pressing the feet onto the floor. See if you can kind of mentally feel the outline of the standing body and then begin some deep, slow breathing to take three seconds or more to expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Bring the air into the upper part of the chest. Feel that expansion. Hold the air a couple of seconds, and then slowly breathe out, feeling the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Take a few more deep, slow breaths like that getting your mind focused in the, in the body. So we coordinate these movements with this deep, slow breathing and repeating each one, each exercise three times with a longer pause before going on to the next one. You can open the eyes and kind of observe as I talk you through this. On the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, bend your back a little bit, On the out breath, turn the palms down and touch the top of your head. Begin in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch your lower back. Out breath, touch the top of the head. Once more, in breath. Stretch upwards, hold that upward stretch longer. Feel the sensation. And release the fingers, the out breath, arms back to the side. And just relax. 
Keep the mind focused in the body, try to feel the increased body sensations, especially in your hands or fingers, maybe the chest. If you can't feel that, feel your feet pressing the floor. And just remember standing, standing. And the present moment of the body. Just letting go of your thoughts. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Just keep remembering, standing, feeling the body in the front of the awareness. Now in the next in breath, push up on the toes while raising the arms over the head. And this way, facing the hands toward each other about six inches apart and stretch up. On the out breath, come back down, arms to the side, heels to the floor. Use the breathing to help lift and lower the body. And the in breath, up. Stretch out in. Relax, gently close the eyes, just keep feeling the body, especially the increased pulsation sensations in your hands and fingers. The increased sensation is due to the activated life force, the oxygenated blood vibrating, interacting with other cells, tissues, producing sensations. Just remember standing, standing all those sensations occurring within the standing body. Okay, now <clears throat> spread your feet about three feet apart. We do an exercise to stretch the ligaments of the knees and the hips, especially Get stressed during a sitting posture. The hands at the chest, in breath, breathe in, hands over the head. On the out breath, lower the hands to the chest and bend the knees and lower the body down. Try to keep the torso upright. Come down as far as you comfortably can. Feel stretch in the knees and hips. In breath, all the way up. Hands over the head. Be an out breath. In. Out. In. in the out breath, arms back to the sides, relax, Just feel the body exactly as it is, each foot 
pressing the flow. The arms and hands hanging at the sides. Clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top, different sensations on your face. This body as it is here and now, the present moment. Letting go of your thoughts. Remember standing, standing. Now keeping the legs apart, we'll do side bending. We'll breathe in. On an out breath, bend over the right side, let the right hand slide down below the right knee, if possible, as far as you can bend over. In breath, lift back up. Pause a moment, then the out breath, bend over the left side, out breath. Out. In. Out. In. Once more to each side, out breath. In. Out. In breath up. Relax, you just feel the body exactly as it is. The advanced skill and mindfulness is to be able to just feel the general outline of the body any time and any place. That way you'll know what's happening in or on the body more easily. Now hold the arms out. We'll do twisting from right to left. Breathe in. Look at the right hand on the out breath, twist around, keeping your eyes focused on the hand going backward. Let the feet turn a little bit. On the in breath, come back to the front and let the feet turn with the body. And then the other side out breath. In breath, the front. Begin to the right out breath. In breath. Out. In. Out.
Relax. Feel the increased sensation in your shoulders, chest. Feel the increased heart beating. Sort of mentally feel the outline of the body. Feet pressing the floor, hands at the sides, head on top. And taking an inner, inner mental photograph. Standing, standing. Standing, all those vibrations. Okay, now we're going to do forward and backward bending. You have to be careful with the back bends. When you bend back, especially when you lift up from a back bend, there could be some kind of inner shaking or some like some dizziness. So. Uh, don't want you to fall down, so uh, don't bend back too far the first time. Let the hands touch the front of the legs. Breathe in. On the out breath, bend forward. Let the hands come to your kneecaps the first time. Keep the legs straight. Keep the head lifted up, looking out straight ahead. Try to flatten the spine to get the hump out of the spine, making it like a table. You can balance a full cup of tea without spilling a drop. In the in breath, lift up. Move the hands around under the buttocks for support. Let the head go back. In the out breath, gently bend backwards, not too far the first time. Keep the eyes open. Look up at the ceiling. In breath, carefully lift up. Be aware of any shaking. In the out breath, again forward. Let the hands come down below the knees about halfway if you can. Still keep the head up. And flatten the spine. In breath, lift up. Again, the back bend out breath. Try to bend back a little more. In breath up. And third time, let the hands come down as far as you can toward the feet. Still try to keep the head lifted a little bit. Legs straight, feel the stretch in the hamstring muscles in the back of the legs. Hold it a little longer. Feel the sensations. Even the in breath, straightening up. And one more time, the back bend, out breath. In breath, lift up. And just relax on the out breath, relax the arms to the sides. Mentally feel the whole body, each foot pressing the floor, 
hands touching the side of the legs, clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top. Feel the sensation in your head or face. Just remember standing, standing. And now bring your feet back together. We'll just do one last exercise, the head turning from right to left. Try to stand straight, keeping the chin level to the floor. Try not to move your shoulders and the head turning, just pivoting the head on the neck vertebrae. On an in-breath, turn your head to the right as far as you comfortably can. Or you look over your right shoulder. And on the out-breath, turn the head 180 degrees back to the left concentrating into the neck vertebrae, imagining them loosening up. Again, in breath back to the right. You turn your eyes to the right, to look a little bit behind you. In breath, out breath to the left. In breath, right. Out breath, left. And the next in breath, let the head stop in the center, just relax, just mentally feel. Standing body exactly as it is. Feet pressing the floor. The arms and hands at the sides. The head on top. All the various little pulsations, body sensations. The here and now of the body, present moment awareness, standing, 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 a knowing consciousness. Okay, friends, so let's come back to our seats and get ready for the sitting meditation.
in the Bhavana Society greenhouse, wrong place here. Not on modern technology. Okay, friends, so I will be ready for our meditation. Normally I'm turning off the video. Let's try to sit straight. Try to keep the back of the head and the spine in a straight line. Or bring your total attention down to feel where your buttocks and feet press the floor underneath. Starting with the buttocks, the feel the buttocks pressing the seat. Feel that solid contact, that earth vibration in you. Flesh and bones of the body floor, the cushion. Feel those different sensations. Try to feel your left butt tuck then the right butt tuck. Ability to move the attention and notice different things is a, a good skill. Mindfulness meditation. Hold the attention on these different body parts without the mind getting lost in the past or future. And then just feel those sensations in the buttock. And let the awareness kind of move down the legs to the knees. Going over the knee and down the lower leg to the feet. And just try to focus on the, the feet. You can do one at a time if you like, the right to the left one. Feel the heel, and the arch, and the toes. And feel where the socks rub against the skin of the feet, producing sensation. Just notice any little prickling sensations or pulsation, tingling sensation. If you can notice the outline of different tones, Big toe to other toe. Feet. And let the awareness just rise up a little bit. Just feel the whole pelvic area, the groin area. Feel lots of sensation there between the hips. Just the life force in the body. And feel your hands and fingers where they touch together, where they touch the legs. And feel the left hand and the right hand. Feel the subtle pulsations, vibrations.
See if you can notice the outline of the thumbs or fingers. Feel the arms hanging from the shoulders and feel the weight of the arms. Feel where the clothing touches the skin of the arms, shoulders. And the chest. And just knowing, understanding that this, this is the sitting body, the body is sitting. Just letting go of your thoughts, just think about the body, the present moment of the body. Now feel the head balanced on the top of the neck. And keep your chin lifted up, level, parallel to the floor. And straighten the spine. And try to find the center of gravity, top of the head and spine over the hips. Kind of just move the whole head and spine gently backwards a little bit until you come close to that tipping point where the body might go backwards and just come forward half an inch and try to maintain that erect posture. And you feel your face as though you were looking from the inside out Feel your face in front, the skin stretched over the skull, the forehead, the nose, the chin, cheeks. Just feel some sensations on the face. Feel the lips touching together, the upper lip touching the lower lip. The sensation of dryness or moistness in the lips. These are all just different sensations. Because of the contact Sensations, feelings arise. And try to feel the tongue laying in the mouth. And the teeth of the gums. And the sensations of the teeth and gums. Feel the eyes in the sockets, the eyelids stretched over the eyeball. I feel some the eye movements. You might even feel the pulse of blood in the capillaries of the eyeballs or eyelids.
might see some light or color or even a mental image or just darkness. Just remember sitting, sitting, Now from this point behind the eyes, let the awareness kind of expand a little. You feel the outline of the sitting body. It's the general outline of the sitting body, the buttocks and feet pressing the floor underneath. The hands in the center, the arms at the side, the head balanced on top. Just try to hold that outline of the sitting body in the mind's eye like you were taking an internal video of the sitting posture from inside. It's the different sensations, a collage of sensations. And then begin some deep, slow breathing again, like we were doing in the yoga. I take three or four seconds to expand the abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest, holding the air in for two or three seconds to feel that subtle oxygenation of the blood and feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. Just try to take several more deep, slow breaths like that cultivating this basic mindfulness of breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. We want to try to count the breaths from one to 10 to develop a better concentration, to not forget the counting. So with the next incoming expanding in breath, mentally count one. You feel that brief pause with the contracting out Breath also count one, feeling the last bit of air go out of the lungs. The next in breath, two. The out breath, two. In breath, three. Out breath, three.
in breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath five. In breath six. Out breath. Six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. Now discontinue the counting. Let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled, shorter rhythm. Continue to feel it, Just keeping the attention focused there in the center of the body. Feel the subtler expanding and contracting sensations in the abdomen, the stomach, chest. There. Try to notice whether clothing rubs against the skin of the stomach or chest. Use those as the kind of initial concentration points to help stay alert. Try to notice how each breath is different. Sometimes you feel it in the abdomen. Sometimes you feel it more in the chest. Different sensations are always changing. Knowing when the breath is coming in. And knowing when the breath is going out. Know it by feeling it. Because of the contact, the sensations arise. Then you remember those sensations, recognize it as breathing, as breathing in and breathing out. It's all based on sensation. If it helps to stay focused, you can use these mental notes in, in sitting, 
out, out, sit in. Try to notice the brief pauses between the breaths, the brief pause, just feel, remember that you're sitting. In, in, sitting, out, out, sitting, cultivating concentrated mindfulness of this breathing body, it's the present moment. Breathing body is the natural connection to the present moment awareness. And the concentration is the ability to not forget the body is sitting and breathing, to feel the sitting and breathing. But the mindfulness is the accompanying awareness of other sensations coming and going, of the possible distractions, the hindrances, or thoughts trying to take your attention away. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. Just feeling the breathing body within the larger sitting body here. They both occur concurrently. They're totally integrated. It's feeling the body in the body. The body of breathing within the larger sitting body. It's called mindfulness of the body. It's feeling all the different changing sensations. This body is a dynamic living process. Even while feeling the expanding and contracting movements of the breathing, you can notice other prickling, itching sensations, clothing touching the skin, or aches or pains occurring on or near the breathing process. Or even elsewhere on the body, They just come and go by themselves. And 
If you happen to hear any noises from the screen or from in your own home, just be aware of hearing sound vibrations coming and going through that same breathing body awareness. Sounds come in through the ears, go through the nervous system, through the body to the brain, registering perception. triggering off memory or thought. And the pauses between the breaths, also check the posture if the chin is dropping downwards or the spine slouching, mindfully straighten the, the back and the head up to straight posture again. You feel that awareness become more bright and clear. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. Moment by moment. Breath by breath. Just cultivating a detached, onlooking awareness. This breathing body, the thinking mind, the five aggregate process, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental reactions, and the consciousness. The sense of I, I or me. It's continually changing. Have the idea, imagine that you're sitting in a movie theater in a balcony seat, just watching this movie of the body and mind process. Sitting, breathing, thinking, hearing. It's all just happening by itself. If you have a good Detached awareness, good concentration. Just try to feel this body and mind being like an empty house with nobody home to answer the call knocking on the doors and windows. So many sensations just coming and going by themselves. Sensations of breathing, 
so many other body sensations and thoughts are urging that there's nobody home that owns them, controls them. Even aches or pains may arise. But there's a sensitive microphone in the house, like a seeing eye camera, security camera that knows, but yet can't do anything. Noticing how quickly different sensations and thoughts or sounds just arise and vanish through this body mind. Just like a fish taken out of water, thrown upon the land, flips and twists about. So does this fickle mind flop and twist around, reacting to various unpleasant, pleasant sensations, getting disturbed, irritated by different sensory stimulation. Struggling to get away from pain, struggling to keep hold of something.
the flickering, fickle mind, difficult to guard, difficult to control. The wise person straightens it as a fletcher straightens an arrow. The mind is hard to check, swift, flitting about wherever it likes. Uh, uh, control of the mind is good. A controlled, tamed mind brings happiness. And thus spoke the Buddha. Dear friends, let's spend the last few minutes of the meditation period sending out vibrations of best wishes, kindness towards ourselves and all other beings. As we've done before, let's do that with coordinating it by some deep, slow breathing. So again, take some deep, slow breaths and hold the air in the lungs for a few seconds, try to feel or imagine that oxygenating blood, life force permeating the nervous system. And on the out breath, imagine that the sensations flooding the nervous system, tranquilizing any tension, stress, negativity. And on the out breath, feel that relaxation of the body and mind into the present moment which is a kind of a healing power. And just take a few deep, slow breaths like that, thinking like this to yourself. May I be well, peaceful and wise, free from greed, hatred, fear and ignorance. May I have the patience, strength, mindfulness and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. And I continue to develop my understanding of the Dhamma and practice of meditation to help free the mind from confusion and suffering. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. And in the same way, with each out-breath, imagine sending these thoughts to your family members, relatives, good friends, wherever they might be. If you know anybody who's sick or ill, other problems, sending a few breaths of these meta-thoughts, vibrations to them. With the out breath, may they be well and happy, free from suffering, free from worry, fear, anxiety. And with each out breath, imagining this, sending these thoughts further afield through the towns and cities across the countryside, across the oceans back home if you're from some other country eventually is spreading those vibrations across the whole earth and if you can imagine the beautiful blue green earth suspended in space it's from the nasa photograph just with each out breath Imagine sending these meta vibrations 
down permeating the atmosphere, permeating the nervous systems of all beings, soothing the fires of their greed, hatred, and delusions, soothing the pains of the physical and mental sufferings, and awakening the seed of love and wisdom in their hearts with the idea that may all beings, wherever they might be, living near or far, the strong or the weak, the rich or the poor, may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all beings be free from the pains and sufferings of body and mind brought about by their unskillful karmic actions and thoughts. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings have the opportunity to hear the teachings of the Dhamma, and to learn and practice meditation to help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together, understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and I invite you to join in chanting the word sadhu three times slowly with with the chanting on a long out breath. So breathe in. Sadhu. Sadhu Sadhu Now place the hands at the edge of the knees and take one more in breath as you breathe in, stretch the head back, pull the hands against the knees, arch your spine. Lift the head up on an in breath and on the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest, stretch the neck vertebra. On the in-breath, lift the chin up level. Relax on the out-breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends. So 
This brings our Sunday afternoon uh, to an end and uh, wish that, uh, you know, in this week leading up to the Christmas time that you're able to, you know, use your meditation practice to help not to uh, allow the mind to fall in into any kind of too much excited or negative kind of vibrations uh, that you can happen around the holiday time. I know that, you know, a lot of you won't be able to go and visit your loved ones and have, you know, Christmas reunions and so on. Uh, and so the tendency to, for the mind, to, you know, get lonely or to get caught up into some, you know, unhealthy type of uh, uh, preoccupations and so on. Uh, so that's really when we need to, you know, have that uh, mindfulness and, and the, the tools to keep our mind uh, centered and grounded. Also practice the M&Ms, you know, whenever you feel the mind getting caught up in, in either in too much excitement or just too much melancholy, just stop taking a deep breath, practice the M&M, the minute meditation, by taking a deep, slow breath, holding the air in your lungs a few seconds, kind of feeling that, you know, sensations of the oxygenated blood and then feeling the relaxation on the out breath. Just letting go of the past and future and just basically just reconnecting to that in uh, the, the present moment awareness that's always there, literally just beneath your nose, there's the parallel universe, the parallel dimension of the now. It's free from the past and the future. If we know how to connect into that, then, you know, that goes a long way, goes all the way. Okay, friends, so I wish you all the best. In Namo Buddhaya. And uh, actually, uh, next Sunday we'll be having a, a we'll be having our Sunday program on, on Sunday, but uh, the following Sunday, which would be, uh, uh, let me see, which would be uh, the, the, the New Year's Day, I think, or, or any, anyway, we'll make an announcement about it. I, the calendars, usually I think Christmas is on a Sunday and now it's on a Friday, so. Uh, but uh, anyway, this week we'll be having the Wednesday and Sunday program. We might have a, take a week break uh, after that because we're having a retreat here uh, actually uh, uh, a week from Wednesday but, uh, but I'm, I'll be sending out the next newsletter in a few days okay friends so again uh, all the best and uh, keep up your meditation practice thank you Bhante thank, thank you very much you, Bhante. And you're welcome thank you, Bhante. yes Hello. Thank you. All the way down in Brazil. Yes, we are trying to keep our mind in equanimity in this pandemic times. So. Especially for you living in the mid middle of Sao Paulo to 